We're going to sing a hymn you, you may not be real, real familiar with. If you need the words and the music, it's hymn number 552 in the hymn book. So if you want to get your hymn book, we're going to sing the first, second, and the fourth verses. It's I am thine, O Lord. Let's stand and sing it together. That is a prayer on everybody's heart. We can sing that every day. We could pray that every day. Lord, whatever happens today, may it draw me nearer to you. <laughs> I kidded some of these guys. Uh, they, didn't, they didn't take it too seriously, what I said to them over there. Uh, for you that uh, you hear that you know this, but those that are watching <clears throat> by internet tonight, we, we, we sing our breath and our tonsils out for 30 minutes. <clears throat> and then when we get through singing about 30 minutes, I lean over to those that are beside me and I say, now, boy, we had not got much left. And <laughs> they felt like said, that's not our problem, that's your problem. <laughs> you know, and then you get to go sit down and sing one song and uh, they said, that's why the Lord called you to preach and didn't call us. Uh, and so, uh, uh, but uh, we're grateful to be here tonight and glad to have our WMU in here. We pray for Lynn and Bill tonight. Bill is in the hospital at Grace down in Morganton. I put him in and uh, Bill Queen is in the hospital and they're running a series of tests on him and going to uh, try to find out what's going on with him. He's having some problems. You know, he had COVID about three weeks ago and coming out of that, he has uh, really hadn't got his strength back. And then some other things started to happen, and some other issues uh, started happening with him. And so they finally had to take him down uh, to the hospital, Grace Hospital in Morganton. So uh, please remember <coughs> Bill and Lynn. They're always here and would be here, so we pray for them. 
If the Lord wills and things works out, they'll try to do some stuff for the WMU next Wednesday night. We're still collecting items out there uh, to send down to Florida. And uh, you can keep bringing them. Uh, and we're going to uh, hopefully, <clears throat> hopefully next Wednesday night, before we begin service in here, we're just going to meet over there and pray over them and dedicate all those items and uh, for the Lord to send them to the right place. And uh, so uh, plan on that. Then they're going to uh, they're going to take care of them. I do. I will put this in the in the bulletin. But uh, next Wednesday, uh, we'll meet next Wednesday WMU. But after lunch on Sunday, we need some ladies that'll help sort out these products to go to Florida with the hearts with hands. And uh, we need some small, medium boxes to pack them in. So if you can bring some boxes, and uh, they'll do that right after the meal uh, Sunday. You can, uh, you can fill yourself full at the table Sunday, and then we'll fill the boxes full. How about that? Nobody, no, anybody agree with me about that? You might have agreed on the first part. Well, I'll fill my stomach. Well, if you fill your stomach full, then we're going to fill the boxes full, and we're going to get them ready to send to Florida. So uh, if you'll do that, it will be greatly appreciated. Thank you for praying for Miriam. She, after spending spend hours in the car yesterday, uh, she hadn't recovered from that. So thank you for your prayers for her. Well, we are studying some on Wednesday night about God talking to his people. And I think we've established the truth that God does speak to us. And he's not limited on the ways that he talks to us. He can use anything. He can use anybody. In fact, when you read through the Old Testament, it is, it is such a, it's amazing how God talked to people. Had a donkey one time he spoke to and spoke through because the person he is speaking to is very stubborn. And God got his attention. Do you know before you ever really communicate with anybody, you've got to get their attention. If you ever talked to anybody and when you were looking at them, you knew they were not listening to what you had to say. You did not have their undivided attention. Well, before we ever get to the ways that God talks to us and all the different things he says to us, in this study we're talking about the ways that God gets our attention. I uh, heard about an old farmer. He has had a mule attached to his wagon. And he tried to get the mule to get started, and he wouldn't budge. So he got out of the wagon, he walked around, and he found a big old stick, and he picked it up, hauled off, and hit that mule right between the eyes. And the old mule sort of staggered a little bit. He got back in, in his wagon, and he said, Now get up, let's get going. Well, the mule didn't budge. And he got out of the wagon and he found a lead pipe and uh, he hauled off and hit the mule right between the eyes sort of knocked him down to his knees after the first time he said that's one when he hit him between the eyes with that lead pipe the old mule staggered to his feet he got in the wagon and said now let's go he didn't budge he got out of the wagon this time, reached in his back pocket and pulled out a pistol and said, now this is three. <laughs> now I just wonder sometime, does God ever have to count it down and say, I've talked to you and I've talked to you and I've talked to you. But you have not listened to what I've had to say. So I need to get your attention. God's got all kinds of ways to get our attention. And it is very important for us to listen to what he has to say. One of the things that Jesus said in the New Testament, uh, can, you believe, can you believe people listening, being in the presence of Jesus, hearing what he had to say, watching what he did? 
And he said, you have become dull in your hearing. Uh, you hear, but you do not hear. You see, but you do not see. Uh, it's, not, it's not that God is not talking. He has a lot to say. But we're reminded all through the book of Revelation, he said again and again and again, he that hath ears, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. And so it is very crucial in the Christian life that we hear what the Lord has to say. And so we, we began this past Sunday talking about the ways that God uses to get our attention. We're not talking tonight uh, about uh, what he has to say. We're just talking about the ways that God gets our attention. That is, first and foremost, God is talking, but the issue is, are we listening to what he has to say? Um, I, just, I just point these out. I think she'll put them up there on the screen tonight. God begins by speaking to us. Uh, one of the methods he uses creates within us a restless spirit. I mean, just on the inside of us. In fact, I think that happens to a person before they ever get saved. Even the, even the unsaved person sort of gets restless on the inside. My, my wife said to me before I finally surrendered to the Lord, she said to me, just, just as honest, I understand what she means now. She said, I'm just going to tell you, if you had not given your life to the Lord Soon, after all these weeks of being miserable and making me miserable, we probably would have got a divorce. Well, I'm just going to tell you, God can make you miserable, and he also can make the person you're living with miserable as well. You ladies all say amen to that. That is true. He does that with a sinner, you know. You just, he won't let you just go on and on and on without being bothered, and he creates within you a restless spirit. And I think if he wants to get our attention, he also does that to his, uh, to his children. Uh, we, we read about some examples of that in the Bible, that uh, he gives a restless spirit. Secondly, he sometimes speaks through other people, a word that comes to us through others. Oh, thank God for the people in my life that uh, were not afraid, not ashamed uh, to tell me and to speak to me uh, about my relationship to God and about my need to obey the Lord. Uh, God speaks through other people. Thirdly, here, here's a way, probably we like the way God speaks, is all the blessings that God gives us. Do you, do you know tonight that every blessing you got, God is saying, I love you. Isn't that what you say? Isn't that what you do to your children? I mean, when you want to, when you want to sh express your love to them, you just want to be good to them. Don't have to be any any reason. Just you just want to be a blessing to them. God can send blessings our way, and I think He says to us, uh, He just wants to talk to us that He blesses us. I mentioned Sunday night, and we alluded to this several times. A lot of times, the way God talks to us. It's through our unanswered prayers. We pray and we wonder why, why our prayers not answered. Well, I, I, think, I think for a believer, if God doesn't answer my prayer, you know the first thing I ought to do? I need to check up and see if there's any sin in my heart against God. I cannot blame God. I cannot blame other people. I need to pray, Lord, create in me a, a heart that loves you and a new spirit that's in me because the psalmist did say that if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me when I pray. And so if I'm not getting my prayers answered, that might be God just wanting to get my attention and have something to say to me Unanswered prayers. If your prayers are not being answered, there could be a variety of reasons. You ought to check it out. You ought to, you ought to pray and ask God about it. 
Now, we talked about those four things Wednesday night. I got more than four after this, so that means you've got to listen quickly, all right? I'll, I'll talk that fast if you'll listen fast. Now, if you're a slow listener, don't blame me. We'll just, we'll just settle down on some of these things. Why? How does God get my attention? Here is number five. Sometimes disappointments that come into our life, it might be a means that God wants me to stop and listen to his voice. That is illustrated all through the scripture. I picked out a passage over in Numbers chapter 14 uh, that talk about the, uh, the nation of Israel and how God wanted to talk to them. They, they, they didn't want to listen. They didn't hear God. So you know what God did? God allowed them to have some disappointments in their life. Uh, early in their deliverance out of, the, out of Egypt, uh, fresh out of that bondage, they're headed to the promised land. You know the story where they sent out spies to the promised land? Of course, they came back, 10 of them came back with a negative report. Two of them came back positive. I, I, that number probably hadn't increased too much in this day. Probably 10 out of 12 were so negative in our day. Amen, preacher. I, I, you know, that's just the way it is. God judged them because of their unbelief and their unwillingness to possess the land. People of God realized what they did. And in Numbers chapter 14 and verse 40, it was after they, they were disappointed, they rose early in the morning. Here are the scriptures right on the screen. Numbers 14 and verse 40. They rose early in the morning, went up to the top of the mountain, said, Lo, we be here, and we'll go up unto the place which the Lord hath promised, for we have sinned. Now, it hadn't been long before that. They said, we're not going up. But after, after some defeat in their life and disappointment in their life, they finally went to the Lord and said, now, Lord, we're ready to go now because we have sinned. And Moses, most of you probably wouldn't want Moses to be your pastor because the next verse says in verse 42, Moses said, Wherefore now do you transgress the commandment of the Lord, but it shall not prosper. Verse he said, the Lord is not going to bless you. Go not up, for the Lord is not among you, that you be not smitten before your enemies. You're talking about getting their attention. God had to get their attention. They'd just come out of that bondage. And uh, I think they still could remember fresh in their mind all the bad things that had happened to them down in Egypt. The promised land was before them. And they said, we're not going. And God said to them, all right, I'll let you live with your choice. I'll let you live with this disappointment. Now, I just want to say tonight that sometimes some of the great disappointments in life is God trying to get our attention. It's God trying to get us to look to Him. God uses disappointment. And uh, we don't view it that way, but God does. Uh, I think about, I think about the dis disappointment that came in the life of Job. Uh, Job, uh, when he faced all the difficulty, all the hard things happened to him, 
He didn't understand it, but his family didn't understand it. And uh, Job chapter 2 and verse 9, here's what the scripture said. Job chapter 2 and verse 9, his wife came to him. Here's his closest one to him. And she said to him, do you still hold your integrity? I mean, you claim that God is still good to you. Why don't you just curse God and die? And Job responds in the next verse. He said unto her, Thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. What? Shall we receive good at the hand of God, and shall we not receive evil? In all of this did not Job sin with his lips. Boy, you're talking about a disappointment in his life, but Job made sure that he did not blame God, and he did not use his mouth to accuse God of doing wrong. I'm just going to tell you, the devil will cause us to use our words to blame God if we're not careful in our disappointment. Disappointments may get our attention sometimes. What do we do in disappointments? We wring our hands. We become angry. We become bitter. God may be trying just to teach us and to get our attention. He's got something to say to us. Number six. Talking about attention getters. How does God get our attention? He does use unusual circumstances to turn our eyes and hearts to him. God ever done anything unusual in your life? I'm just sort of out of the ordinary. You, you got no other explanation for it. You cannot explain it. You just have to say that was the hand of God. That was God that did it. May not have happened to anybody else. In fact, when I read about the conversion of Saul to Tarsus, as far as I know, there's no other record in all the Bible that where Saul had a convert, nobody had a conversion like Saul. But God used that to get his attention and to drive him to believe in his faith in God. I can't help but think about over in the book of Exodus, very familiar story. We all know it. We've read the scripture. We've preached on it. You know the story, Moses, Exodus chapter 3, verse 1, he was out keeping the sheep of his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. He led that flock to the backside of the desert. He came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. He looked and behold, the bush burned with fire and the bush was not consumed. When he saw that, he responded in verse 3 and 4. Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight while the bush is not burned. Well, I guess he did. God got his attention, right? And when the Lord saw that he turned aside, God said, I've got your attention now, Moses. God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here am I. God got his attention. One of the unusual experiences that are in the scriptures. Child of God, sometimes we get so busy that we don't hear what God has to say. I believe God is a sovereign God. and God cares so much about us that he will get our attention one way or another. I just ask you to think about are there times in your life that God used to get your attention? Probably go around this room tonight and ask people to stand up. You probably could pick out at least one time, one thing in your life. Somewhere along the line, God got your attention. If you don't, look out. There's one coming down the road somewhere. There is. Studying this, I thought back. 
this, this may not mean a thing to you. But at the time it happened to me, it meant a lot to me. Uh, I learned something from it, and one of my, one of my church members did. I had a guy in my church down in South Carolina. Wife was a faithful member of our church, and she prayed and prayed for him. And he finally, and I sort of talked with him, became buddies with him, and, you know, and so he finally, finally surrendered, and he came, he was faithful, coming to church, and, you know, and we just, we were just, uh, even outside the church, he was, he was a friend of mine, I was a friend of his. Uh, we would cut up and say things to one another. Uh, we had a revival scheduled in our church down there. And so I, I got up, you know, I was a young pastor. I got up and I stressed about the revival and I said, now don't you, don't you let anything, anybody interfere with you coming. God's going to do something in this revival and don't you, don't you let there be any distractions, anything that will hinder you. I will assure you the devil will throw up everything in this world to keep you from being here to hear what God has to say to you. Well, this, this friend of mine uh, came to me after church and he said, Oh, Pastor, hate to tell you this. He said, You know, I'm a, I'm a big deer hunter. And I said, Yeah, I know that. And he said, I hate to tell you, but I've already, me and some of my buddies have already made reservations. And we've already paid our money and we are, have already staked out property. And we're going uh, the same week we're having revival. And uh, by me knowing him and him knowing me, I just casually said to him, sort of in a joking way, I said, well, go ahead and go deer hunting that week, but I'm just going to tell you, you're not going to see deer one that week. I just left it at that, you know. Well, guess what happened? <laughs> he went that week. By Wednesday, he came home mad. I mean, he is madder than a wet hen. You know what, what a wet, wet hen, how mad they get? Some of you northerners don't know that, but some of us know what that is. I mean, he, he is fighting mad. And uh, his wife said, uh, oh, he, he came home early. I said, what did he come home early for? He said, because what you said to him, I said, uh, because what I said, yeah, you told him, just go on Miss Revival, and he's not going to see a deer. He'd been down there night and day for three or four days, and he hadn't seen one deer, and you're the reason for it. I thought, oh, Lord. And so I, I, tried, to, I tried to talk to him. He didn't want to talk to me. I ain't talking to you. I said, well, we be friends. No, we're not friends any longer, he said. I said, I'm your pastor. I don't want to talk to you, he said. I said, okay. And uh, his wife just kept on coming. And I prayed for him. And uh, he prayed against me and I prayed for him. <laughs> and uh, I, did, I didn't take it seriously what I said to him, but boy, he took it. But I was the reason he never saw a deer. And uh, went by two or three months like that. If you, if you knew where our church was, right in the corner of the city limits, and uh, the church was here and we had a, all the property on that end that led to the city, uh, to the line, we had, uh, right up the road from the church was a, uh, it was apartments, it was low income housing. And uh, 
I'd spent, I'd spent months and months and months trying to get folks out of that low-income housing to come be a part of our church. You know, you know what they said to me? They said, first of all, there ain't been nobody from that church down there ever invited us to come. Secondly, they said, you see where we live? Do you see, do you see that big brick church down there that you pastor? They said low-income people living in a housing developed and a big old brick church, they just don't seem to go together. And it wasn't all their fault for feeling that way because there are a lot of folks sitting in Baptist churches feel the same way. And so I pleaded and I said, oh, no, no, you can come. And uh, we had, uh, we had one young lady that came. She had some struggles she had some emotional, some uh, issues going on with her. And uh, but she shows up at our church. And uh, we welcomed her and loved her. She lived right in those low-income housing development up there. So I... She left church. She wouldn't let anybody take her. She said, oh, I can see my apartment. I'll walk home. And she left church one Sunday. She went out the door and started up that highway. The same, same guy that got mad at me came and picked up his wife, pulled out of the parking lot, started up the road, and accidentally ran into this girl and knocked her down on the highway. This was after Sunday morning service. Didn't do a whole lot of damage to her. Next Sunday morning, here sits this guy sitting right in church. <laughs> I preached. He got up and he walked down that aisle and he started crying. And he stood up for that church and he said, I just want to tell you, I got mad at my preacher for saying something to me that I should have never gotten mad about. And said, do you know last Sunday when I pulled out of this parking lot, I could have run over this girl and could have killed her. But God was so good to me that I didn't do that. But brother, did he ever get my attention. And he told me, God told me, you get yourself out of that house on Sunday morning. You get back down there to church where you ought to be. And you get things right with God. Now you may hear that tonight and say, oh, that was just an accident. You convince this guy that was an accident. Because he'll tell you even today, God had to get my attention. And he used unusual circumstances. Do you believe God can use anything and anybody to get our attention? Sure he can. Job said, the same God that gave me all of this stuff is the same God that has the right to take it away. Blessed be the name of the Lord, he said. I'm just saying how God gets my attention. I don't want to have to hit me between the eyes. I'm just going to tell you. I, I, I want to say, speak, Lord. I hear what you got to say. But he does, he does use unusual Never has happened before and hasn't happened to me since. Thank God for that. But I tell you on that day, brother, he got my attention and he got this man's attention to stop and say, God, you've got something to say to me. 
unusual circumstances. How does God get my attention? Here's number seven. I said a while ago, sometimes blessing, but do you know sometimes failure, God gets my attention. I tell you, the nation of Israel, brother, you read all of these going on in their life. They had already gotten out of Egyptian bondage and they'd come all the way to the promised land. And we all know the story. When they, when they got to this big city called Jericho, God blessed them and God gave them the victory. But they turned right around. And this next little old place called Ai is just up the road from Jericho. They probably couldn't look back to Jericho and remember all the victories they had. But here they came right up there to Ai. They got so confident in themselves. Why, we can do this without God. We don't need anybody's help. In fact, we don't need all of our army. We can handle this by ourselves. I'm going to tell you sometime, we say, God, I can handle this by myself. God may just step back and let us do it. He may let us fall flat on our face. You just think about when you deal with your children sometimes. They don't want your help. You know what you say sometimes? Well, I'll just let you. Just I know where you're going to end up. When God ever blesses us spiritually, financially, any other way, just remember, it came from God. We didn't get it by ourselves. And all these blessings that come to us, it ought to bring our attention to him and do not forget all the things that God has done for us. Failure, sometimes we fail. God allows us, but we don't have to stay in failure. Aren't you glad failures are not always final? But praise God, there is hope and there is life after our failure. And talk about some of these personal experiences. You think about what God uses to, just to get our attention. Number eight. We don't like to talk about this. Sometimes we run into financial problems. I, don't, I don't, don't even need to ask. And I wouldn't ask for a response from you tonight anyway. If you're, if you're a dad, if you're a mom, you may look back, it may not be that way now, but you can look back early in your life. But all your finances dried up and you wonder, how am I going to make it? How am I going to, how am I going to make it financial? There's a lot of people going through that now, no fault of their own. But sometimes God may use financial problems just to get our attention. When you study the book of Judges, Scripture said that in, the, in that book of Judges over and over again, that everybody was doing what was right in their own eyes. When they decided they were going to do what they wanted to do, boy, did they get into all kind of trouble? Uh, one of the things they did, God had told them, said, when you get over there, don't you, don't you intermingle with the women of these heathen nations. Don't you intermarry them. I want you to be my people. I want you to be a separate people. But when you read, when you read that book of Judges, it, it is amazing what God's people did and what God did to them. Judges chapter 6 verses 1 through 6. I think I'll read it tonight. Listen to it. The children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian seven years. Stubborn? You think stubborn? Seven years? And the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel? And because of the Midianites, the children of Israel made them the dens which are in the mountains 
and caves and strongholds. Imagine, here's God's people running and digging caves and having to flee and hide out for their lives. And so it was when Israel had sown, Midianites came up and the Amalekites and the children of East, East even, they came up against them. And they encamped against them and destroyed the increase of the earth till thou come unto Gaza and left no sustenance for Israel, neither sheep nor ox nor ass. For they came up with their cattle and their tents and they came as grasshoppers for multitude. For both they and their camels were without number and they entered into the land to destroy it. And Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites and the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. I just ask you tonight, when did they cry unto God? When God took everything away from them. They didn't cry out unto God before. It was when God, when they were driven into the caves of the mountains, they hid for their lives. They were thought they was going to die. And every material possession was stripped away from them. And when they had nothing, then they cried unto the Lord. I don't even have to ask you tonight. Your finances ever dry up? Hmm. Probably could look back at times when you had you had uh, all that you needed and then some, but then they began to fade away, fade away. God can get our attention. Just going to tell you. We hold on to a promise from God, but God promised that he would supply all my needs according to his riches and glory. Um, during the World War II, there was an industrious man. His part of the Allied forces, uh, he made the machinery moving uh, all kind of places in the Pacific Islands. He's a committed Christian. He said, I'll, I'll honor God with what God's blessed me with. It was in the late 20s when his business started really growing. He said, I think what I'll do, and he did this before he became so wealthy and prosperous. He said, here's what I think I'll do. I'll take this money that I've made and I'll call it God's share. And I'll put it aside. And then when the need comes, I'll put all that back into the business. And he rationalized this and he said, Now, if I do that and use all of my finances to eventually put back in the business, somewhere down the line, my business will prosper because I've done this. And then I'll honor God with my profits. He said, here's what he said. When I made that decision, my business started to decline. And it took about two years that I was financially broke. See, the issue tonight is not, not how much money I have or how much the real issue is. Uh, does God have my attention? Do I honor him? Do I honor him with what he's let me have? God can use financial problems to get our attention, just to get our attention. And to let us know without me, you can do nothing. And without me, you don't have anything. And I think we ought to be reminded every once in a while that all of us came into this world with nothing, and when we leave, we're not carrying any of it with us. 
and what we have between our coming and our going, God has been good to us, and we honor him with that. I'll just be very, very brief on the next two. Here's number nine, tragedy. Does not God use tragedy to get our attention? Oh, my. Tragedy happens sometimes. Numbers 21, verses 4 through 7. It's what Scripture said. Children of Israel, they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to compass the land of Edom, and the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. They had to be Baptists. I'm just saying they just had to be. I mean, they get tired and they get weary and they get discouraged in the way. And when the people get like that, they speak against God and against Moses. Wherefore have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There's no bread, neither is there any water. Our soul loathes like bread. And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. Therefore the people came to Moses, and they said, We have sinned. We have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he may take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. Isn't that amazing? Mm. Could I just say very quickly now, you cannot view, you cannot judge all the tragedy that happens to people as a sign of God's punishment. Not ever, not ever tragedy falls into that category. There are a lot of unexplained tragedies. You do know that. And boy, we, we should not be foolish thinking we can explain every tragedy that happens. That just, I tell you, because God is God and you can't explain all the things that God allows and that God does. One of them. Examples, everybody in this building knows the life of Joni Erickson Tata. You know this young lady when she was a teenager? One summer she drove, she dove head first into a pool of shallow water. Instantly paralyzed her. She became a paralegic from the neck down. Spent months in the hospital. Had no, had no idea whether she'd live or die. This question came up and said, how can God allow this to happen? She, it ran through her mind. She'd take, it ran through her heart and through her mind. She had faith in God, but she said, God, how can you allow this to happen? You probably heard her on the radio with a beautiful singing voice. Has no control over her rest of her body. And through the years, she took a paintbrush, put it on a apparatus and put it in her mouth and with her head and her mouth she paints and God's people have been blessed down through the years through the ministry it's ministered to millions of people but it came out of tragedy there are books that have been written lectures She's called upon to go and speak to hundreds and thousands of people and young people. What God did with her tragedy. She doesn't blame God for it. But she says God can use my tragedy to bless God's people. You've read, you've heard, you've heard her. The life of Jim Elliot. 
his wife Elizabeth Elliot. You know the story about him going to serve as a missionary. The Indians where he was, he was in his late 20s. They took his life and they killed him. Yet, his wife said, I look upon his life and the heart that God gave him as a ministry to thousands of people that lose in their life, lose things. And she has written books about how God used this tragedy in her life and in his life to bless millions of people across the country. I just, I just mention, I just mention a final one. I don't, I, I will not elaborate on it. Sometimes God uses sickness and affliction. Many examples of that in the Bible. One I chosen is over there in the book, um, Second Chronicles, saying about Hezekiah. Got sick, and he almost died. He prayed to the Lord, and he asked God to spare his life. And if you read in those two chapters, God heard his cry. God heard his prayer. But he got his attention. Um, Could I just hasten to say, God doesn't use these methods on everybody. Not the same ones. He knows exactly what it is to get my attention. That if I sort of go through this life on my own trying to make it without, without depending on him, you can name all ten of these things I mentioned tonight. God knows how to use each one of them or many of them to get our attention. I love what Jesus said over in the Gospel of John chapter 10 and verse 4. Here's what, what the Lord said, talking about his people. In John 10, when he put it forth his own sheep, he goes before them and the sheep follow him for they know his voice. Brother, I tell you, when God speaks, sheep know the voice of the shepherd and he knows how to get our attention. Then He knows how to get my attention. And I confess, I'm just like you. I get so wrapped up sometime and so busy sometime. That, uh, you know, I'm, I'm doing this on my own. God said, oh, no, I, I just need to talk to you. Would, you. would you let me talk to you? You need to slow down. I'll just get your attention. A few things I'd like to say to you. Well, I want to say like Samuel, Lord, speak. I hear you. I hear what you've got to say. Now, you stand with me tonight. You, you've been so patient and faithful. Uh, to let me share what's been on my heart. And uh, I confess to you, I don't like some of these ways God uses to get my attention. Do you? Do you like some of these ways? Huh? No, no. None of us like disappointments. None of us like failure. None of us like sickness. None of us like these ways. But God can use them because he loves us. I ask you to pray. Pray for Bill and Lynn tonight. Pray uh, Pray for Miriam. Others you want to mention before we pray tonight. Yes. All right, we do remember that. All right, this request for prayer. All right, let's remember this request. Yes.
Amen. Amen. We'll do that. We'll do that. Yes. Right, we'll do that. All right, we'll do that. Yes, sir. Remember Rosie in your prayers. Amen. We're glad you're back, Ruben. We're glad you're home. Amen. Yes. Amen. Amen. All right, let's do that. All right, Father, thank you tonight. You care enough about us that you will, you will speak to us. Lord, there are times we avoid speaking to you, but thank you that you talk to us. And you, you have the best in mind for us. Help us to be sensitive to the voice of God. You've heard every prayer need, every, every person, every need behind the name, and even unspoken requests, you know their need. I pray that you'll touch every family, these that are watching and listening tonight. Lord, I know many of them are suffering. Many of them are in difficult situations. They're facing things that some of us would never face. I pray you'll use all of that just to talk to them and to have some words of comfort for them and to know they're not forgotten by you. They're not forgotten by your people. That we pray for them. Bless them in a very special way. Help us through the days of this week honor you and then we come here on the Lord's day I pray we'll come prepared to worship and we'll truly worship you Lord I pray for this special need on my heart tonight Lord I pray I pray that you'll work everything out according to your plan your will that you'll get glory from it all we put it again into your hands tonight we pray in Jesus name Amen and amen. Bless you for coming. Speak to somebody tonight.